Take our Bibles this evening to two places, turn to two places, first in the Old Testament to a psalm, Psalm 37, and then to a place in the New Testament which quotes the psalm, Matthew chapter 5, and we're considering there the Sermon on the Mount in the third beatitude, the blessed meek. But first Psalm 37, again, which is quoted in the Beatitude, blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the land. And you'll note, in fact, as we'll say later, no less than five times is the fact that the people of God, the meek, shall inherit the land mentioned in Psalm 37. Maybe you can count those times, children, all the times that God's people shall inherit the land. It's spoken of in Psalm 37. But we'll read the first part of that, the first 11 verses, and then the last part, verse 34 and following. Here is significant instruction always in the truth of the gospel, gospel obedience, gospel faith, gospel blessing. May God bless us as we read first the first 11 verses, Psalm 37. Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass, and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord, and do good. Dwell in the land, and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret, it only causes harm. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. But the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. And merely for lack of time, we would skip over the center section and continue to the end, verse 34 and following. Wait on the Lord and keep his way and he shall exalt you to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, you shall see it. I have seen the wicked in great power and spreading himself like a native green tree. Yet he passed away, and behold, he was no more. Indeed, I sought him, but he could not be found. Mark the blameless man and observe the upright, for the future of that man is peace. But the transgressors shall be destroyed together. The future of the wicked shall be cut off. But the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble. And the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because they trust in him. Thus far we read a psalm inspired by the Lord to be sung by the anointed of the Lord, believers in Jesus Christ. We want to consider the third beatitude, as I said, in Matthew chapter 5, the blessing of which is quoted in Psalm 37, to which we'll be referring. But Jesus, speaking from the mount and speaks to the multitudes, including his disciples, and says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And now this third beatitude, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So we continue to hear from Jesus the truth of the kingdom of heaven. That's what Jesus came preaching and calling sinners to repent and to believe the things of the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is about the rule of God in grace over his realm, over his commonwealth, the church of the redeemed, 
through the blood of Jesus and the indwelling spirit. The sermon on the kingdom of heaven is therefore about this, about this gospel. It's the blessed truth. As Jesus begins, it's noteworthy that he begins this way with blessings, what we call beatitudes. These are blessings that are foreign to worldlings. They are, however, the precious gift of God to the people of God, those who are called to faith in him and made citizens of the kingdom of heaven. We've been considering those uh, amazing blessings and also the virtues of those citizens and, and now the virtue of meekness and the blessing of the earth. And we'll note uh, right from the get-go here that the blessing that we've considered that's like it is the kingdom of heaven. But now this one like it is called the earth simply or the land. The meek shall inherit the earth or the land. Perhaps if I could say this as a personal uh, confession, perhaps this is the most elusive of the virtues, meekness. As we shall see, it's basically Christianity on the ground. Christianity that responds to heavy hands of, of sinners and also the heavy hand of God. It's meekness, it's a virtue that proves the worth and the reality of our confession that we're poor in spirit and that we mourn for our sins, here's the test. How are you doing in the uncertain providences of God from our perspective? How are you doing when the sea roils and the waves start to billow and you're in your little bark of a boat? How are you doing in the trials of life and especially those trials when sinners accost you and rebuke you and reproach, reproach you and in other ways mock you for being Christian. I say this is hard for me. I wonder if it's hard for you to be meek in light of these things to which uh, we are exposed in this world. But then again, though it's elusive to me and to you, I want to commend to your attention it is a fact there are these meek in the earth. Jesus is not speaking ethereally, just hypothetically. He's speaking of the reality of the citizens of the kingdom of heaven. In fact, all of these beatitudes pertain to all of the citizens of the kingdom of heaven. You, Christian, and they refer to me, Christian, and they are, therefore, gifts of God's grace. And so this virtue, which is elusive and not natural, of course, it's not natural, it's a gift of grace, is ours and is ours to have and to increase in. And perhaps there's some of us like myself who shake his head or her head and say, I just can't be meek and I can't control myself, especially with regard to certain people or, or providences. Well, this sermon's for you. Jesus is speaking of a reality and a blessing and the Spirit now will accompany the Word. And as we trust in God to speak of meekness, lo and behold, we shall be made meek and meeker, and we shall understand the blessing of inheriting the land. So first, I want to consider the preciousness of this virtue, the, the fact of it and the preciousness of it, and then how it's obtained. It's obtained in, a, in an amazing, costly way. And then thirdly, the blessing that is worldly but otherworldly, the blessing of the land. And that, I will speak to you, is of this land that is ours now as a portion of our inheritance through Jesus Christ. So, meekness. Here's a definition, a working definition, as we work through this together. A virtue is meekness, a good thing, a quality, given by God as a fruit or an aspect, we could call it, of humility. In other words, it's a virtue that's given by God where the humble person knows he's nothing before God. Now, that's important for us to speak of those things right now because it's hard sometimes to figure out just what meekness is. For example, 
in distinction from the other two qualities of Christians who are called the poor in spirit. How is meekness different from that? And they're called those who mourn. What is it about meekness? And we say it's humility, it's the culmination really of the poverty of spirit and the mourning in response to it, and especially this. I think this is biblical to be sure. Meekness is a virtue that shows itself in all that God sends his way. And so the poverty of spirit, that's something that is given to us as we are given to realize we're nothing. There's nothing in our cupboards. It's a poverty of spirit. Nothing of our righteousness that can attain anything with God. And the mourning is the result of that. The mourning is of those who see we're impoverished, impoverished, and it's not just because we've had bad luck, but it's because we have bad spiritual DNA. We're Adamites. We're born in Adam, and Adam has left us a leg legacy of nothing, of darkness and death and destruction. And as well, we show ourselves to be the responsible ones in Adam when we ourselves act sinfully. So we reflect upon our poverty, that it's this thing in Adam that we all have, this poverty, and that it's also something that we, well, we, we have in ourselves as sinners. And this, I say, makes us where God wants us to be, humble. This recognition of our poverty, this reflection upon it so that we mourn and we weep with a godly sorrow that leads to repentance that shall not be repented of, that makes us all humble, that leads to this, to this progression of sanctification. And so that, and this is where humility especially shows itself, so that it's not just when me and God are together, maybe in the closet, and I'm praying to God that I know I'm humble. But humility shows itself in the providences of God. With respect to God, meekness is the virtue of the humble soul responding to everything that God sends his way in a humble sort of way. That's the first thing. It's meekness towards God's providence and dealings with him that is front and center with meekness. The word praus in the Greek language, blessed are the praus, is closely related <clears throat> to humility. And that can be seen, as I said, because it follows the first two beatitudes. There's, pover there's poverty of spirit, there's mourning, the result is humility. And humility, again, as the Bible teaches elsewhere, when we respond to all that God sends us. It's a humble recognition that what he sends is indeed what he sends, and it's for our good. In the second place, proof that meekness is closely related to humility is clear from other places where Humility and meekness are used closely together. In fact, meekness in two significant passages follows what's called lowliness of mind. I'm referring to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 2 in the first place. Ephesians 4 verse 2, where Paul says, in beseeching the saints to walk worthy of the calling which they're called to walk in, he beseeches them to walk and to walk as they're called with all lowliness and gentleness. Now the lowliness there is a lowliness of mind, a humility, humble frame of mind. And gentleness is the same word translated in our text in the Beatitude as meekness. So lowliness and gentleness with long suffering and bearing one another in love is, is how we are to walk. They're together, a lowly frame of mind and then a gentle spirit with regard to the things and the persons in our lives. But also Colossians 3 and verse 12 reminds us of this. When it says, as the elect of God, Paul exhorts us, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility. That's this humility, this lowliness of mind, meekness, 
long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. So there you have together the, the duo, the sister virtues, tender mercies, and then kindness and humility, meekness and long-suffering. Humility and meekness going together. So you have this link here that reminds us that there's a, a lowness of state and mind that's being brought out here when Jesus says these people are blessed. In fact, meekness is an enabling virtue. It enables the sinner humbly to receive everything that God gives with a certain virtue about it and not rebellion. That's why helpless lambs are called meek. Of course, lambs don't have virtues, children, but they're examples, I believe, that God gave to us in the world and in the scripture of what it is to be meek. What can a lamb do after all? Little sheep. Well, basically nothing other than receive the shepherd's crook. They go wherever the shepherd leads them. They also are those who are helpless before the shearer's knife or the butcher's axe. They're defenseless, they're helpless, and well, they may ba a little bit, but they know it, and in the end, they must simply receive what is given to them for good or for evil. So that's the way that meekness works with us. God, our God, before whom we're poor and over, uh, over against whom we are so sinful that we mourn, is the God before whom we receive his providence with meekness. So whatever he sends, you, we receive it meekly. And I am to receive meekly and humbly. Whenever God sends the good, we cheerfully resign ourselves to that. And if it's good, we say, well, we don't deserve this. If it's difficulties, we meekly say, we deserve more, more, good, more difficulties because we're just wretched sinners. So this humility, this meekness before God. But then there's another aspect of humility and meekness. The meekness before God expresses itself even in our relation to others. And this often is where we fall down. It's one thing to take a sickness and disease from God's hand. It's another to take a slap in the face or a slanderous remark from someone who's a mere sinner like we are. Indeed, humility is something that expresses itself before God and before others. And it's a kind of virtue of mildness. You ever know a meek person who really personifies in their personality that they're, they're not out to do you ill? They're there, and, and maybe in their stature itself, maybe there's something about the way they say things or don't that reminds you, well, there's a kind of approachability. You know on that meek person that um, they're not out to get you. In fact, in meekness that God gives to us, we, we show our love to sinners and our estimation of them so that they begin to see that we're gentle. We're not going to get back at them. We're not out to get them. We're not out to retaliate. We're not out to trap them, to insult them. We're simply there to serve them. That's a meek person. It's a great virtue and a necessary virtue in an elder or a deacon or a pastor or a parent or a friend. The virtue of meekness, approachability, it's a relational virtue, so very beautiful. But even when wronged, and that's the, the strength of meekness, when it really shines, the meek sinner does not retaliate when wrong. The meek one is patient and long-suffering. That's why when the virtues are given of meekness and humility, there's long-suffering and forbearance that are listed together with them. Those are the actions and the attitudes of meekness and humility. Non-retaliation, patience, long-suffering, bearing insults, reproach, not harboring grudges, not seeking vengeance. Meekness is not about those things. In fact, someone has said that meekness is like a check to our sinful passions, and especially the passion of anger and a vengeful spirit. If you're a meek person, 
You're cooled off by the virtue of meekness in the heat of the moment so that you stand back, you count to ten as it were, you think upon the providence of God, you think upon the reason this person is in your life, the reason for the difficulty that this person has become or that si the situation is, and you say, I'm going to leave this with God. I'm not going to get back. Vengeance is God's. He will repay. I'm leaving this with him. So the sum of this is that meekness, which Jesus cites here as a great blessing, is a virtue given by God so that we say, I'm going to leave it with God. I'm going to leave my rights with God. You see, it's the exact opposite of, well, maybe the Me Too generation. The exact opposite of the Generation X, or maybe the socialist, who says, basically, I'm born, therefore, I have a right to your stuff. We have no rights, meekness says. We have a right for nothing except we be found in Jesus Christ. So we leave our goods and our kindred to go, as Luther sang. This mortal life also. We leave the future with God. We're not going to be anxious about the future. We're not going to be anxious about marrying. We're not going to be anxious about the loneliness or the present distress that we might be feeling. We recognize that many of these things are out of our hands and, and that the devil is more powerful than we are and that the wolves will all, always uh, outbite us. Uh, we never can win when we step into the ring with Satan. We recognize also that God is our shepherd. And if we be lambs, and if we be even older sheep, we're not much more than lambs. We know this because meekness tells us so. We're in good hands, the hands of our Savior God. Peter says in 1 Peter 3, 4, with regard to women <clears throat> who are to put this on, that meekness and quietness of spirit is a precious thing. I want to address that just right now. Just kind of defined a little bit what meekness is. Now seven things that make us so, so worth our having. Far above rubies and gold is the virtue of meekness. You want this treasure? You want this in your life? Is it missing? Do you think you have a lot of it? Then you probably need more of it, don't you? Here's seven things. Well, first of all, by meekness, and this is the blessing that it is, we honor God. We're honoring God. By our receiving humbly his providences, we're not just being fatalists and not resigning ourselves like the Stoics and the philosophers of the age to, to a kind of passionless, reactionless existence. Rather, we're placing ourselves in the hand of God. We are in the hand of God, but we're actually acknowledging that. The meek do that. And that's honoring to God. Especially when we tell others, and others know we're standing up for this, and, and we're not trying to push back here because we're Christians, and they see that man truly must trust in God. There must be something that's convicting him, that there's more to life than getting rights and getting our piece of the pie and getting ahead and climbing up the corporate ladder on the backs of everyone else who gets in our way. So we honor God. Second, by this we honor and promote relationships. And as I said, meekness is the one virtue that reminds us that we're approachable or others who are meek are approachable. They're not porcupines. There are porcupine people as well as lamb people. Which would you rather fellowship with closely, a porcupine or a lamb? Well, a meek person is like this lamb that is approachable and even huggable. And, and you can tell that person something that you otherwise might not. And that's what meekness makes us, an approachable person. And with regard to difficulties, meekness makes us like wet wood. We can't be roused to a flame very quickly. In fact, when there is flame, when there is difficulties in a relationship, when their sparks are flying and the flames are flying, meekness is there to douse it, 
to put out the fires of passions that destroy relationships and prevent reconciliation. So very often, this is like the first thing that they speak about in the counseling books. The shepherding people after God's heart, they speak of meekness. How important. How important in a relationship when there's uh, that two-ness that maybe is supposed to be a marriage. That at least one be the one who says, I give up. I'm not going to fight this fight. We need to talk in peace and to promote peace and not egos. The meek person is the key to that relationship and that reconciliation. Thirdly, meekness is good for the soul. By it, we quiet ourselves. You know, if you're not a meek person, you're always at unrest. I'm always at unrest. We're not receiving the hand of God, and, and we're not receiving people in our life with gladness and kindness and humility and, and reserve, but instead we just resent it. We resent them. They're an inconvenience to us. They're getting in our way and all of these things. That's a terrible thing. And it's a terrible thing for the soul. Proverbs 16 and verse 32 reminds us of this. He who is slow to anger, and therefore meek, is better than the mighty. Why? And he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. He who is slow to anger is one who rules his spirit. He's better, he's stronger than someone who could take a city with his bare hands. Amazing. There's control of the soul when meekness is there. What a great gift that is and why meekness is so precious. Number four, this is a wonderful virtue of meekness and a wonderful blessing of it. By meekness, we're able to receive instruction from the Word of God. Let me read two passages and make an explanation. Psalm 35 or 25, we sang a versification of that. And verses 8 and 9 says this, Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he teaches sinners in the way. The humble he guides in justice, and the humble, the meek, he teaches his way. And the implication is that if you're not meek, you're unteachable. But if you're meek and humble and you're willing to be submissive to the hand of God, you're, you're there to learn something from the teacher, from God who's guiding you that way. And then just this, James 1.21, <clears throat> James 1.21, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of weak, uh, wickedness and receive, note, with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. So there's two texts from the Old Testament, one from the New. Seeking to endeavor to teach us of practical Christianity, and folks, practical Christianity is the practice of the Word of God. And the practice of the Word of God can only be done when we hear the Word of God, when we're clearly being instructed by what God is saying, when our passions aren't getting in the way, when we're just kind of flippantly lending an ear going through our devotions, but there's this problem in our life on the ground that we refuse to deal with meekly. To that extent that we cannot deal with things meekly, even hard things, we can't hear the Word of God. Oh, we can hear it, kind of, but it doesn't go into the soul. And this is where so many of us fail, myself included. We hear the Word of God and we're all set to listen to the Word of God and to be thrilled by the Word of God and then we go out into the nasty now and now and there it is again and there she is again and there he is again and there that work fellow is again and I'm trying to do this but I can't take it. And there I am again. We meet with I outside the walls of the church. And we've got to deal with our old self that doesn't deal well with outward difficulties because there's a difficulty of the soul. We're simply not believing as we are. So the Word of God has just a superficial way to us. It's just a superficial instruction. 
sounds good. It's a theoretical thing. To the extent that we don't receive it in meekness and have God teach us in the way by holding us by the hand and us walking and following him, maybe covering our eyes, but following him nevertheless, we're not really being led. But as you're meek, it's the instructor's blessing, the instructee's blessing. It's what children need in catechism, not only, but all of us need in the school of grace and discipleship and godliness. Because life, yes, life, don't you know, is not so fun, is not a stroll in the park. But God has left us in this world, and Jesus prayed about that. I pray not that you should take them out of the world, but that you should leave them in it. Why? So that the testing of faith might be known, and the genuineness of it, and the victory of faith in this world may be known, even though it seems like the whole world is against believing. So, <clears throat> religiously have people thought to avoid having meekness in this world, religiously, that they've attempted religiously to leave the world and to be going into a monastery. So you don't have to be meek in a monastery. You just have to be one with a lot of self-discipline and enter the monastery and leave your body at the door. Nothing, no problem to that. Except you have to take your soul into the door. Meekness is not monkness. Meekness is something for those saints like you who live and who rub our elbows and shoulders with the world and ourselves have to deal with all kinds of things and not run away from them. It's, as we'll see, a virtue that requires courage. So, lots of things we've seen here that's a blessing and an ornament of meekness and make it so great. And maybe right at the top there is this ability to receive God's instruction that meekness provides us with. But number five, four, yeah, five, in meekness we do gain courage, as I suggested. Moses was the meekest man in all of the earth. Consider that in a little bit, but Numbers 12, verse 2, I believe. It's amazing to be pointed out in the Old Testament as the meekest man of the earth. And Moses, you see, in his, weakness, in his meekness was not the weakness person that meekness is described, at often, described as often. He was courageous. He stood before Pharaoh and said, let my people go. Jesus, who was a lamb and meek in doing the will of God, was a lion of the tribe of Judah. And he set his face like a flint, as they say, to the cross. The most courageous man in the world, the most meekest man, Jesus. Sixthly, in meekness, we are thereby equipped to be servants of Jehovah. When you honor God, when you're there to promote relationships, when your soul is being blessed and you receive God's instruction and you have a meekness is not weakness but is actually boldness and courage, you are thereby equipped to be a servant of Jehovah. Isaiah 42 even speaks this way, Behold my servant whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights, I put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles, but he will be meek. He will not cry out, nor raise his voice, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street, a bruised reed. He will not break, and smoking flax he will not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth. He will not fail, nor be discouraged. The meek son of God is the servant of God. Very important. And finally, meekness is vital for a witness. 1 Peter 3 and verse 5, Peter writes, 1 Peter 3, excuse me, verse 15, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that's in you with meekness and fear. You know, the most pathetic thing is a shriveling Christian 
a complaining Christian, a proud Christian. Those Christians, so-called, are the opposite of the meek Christian. And when we're proud and complaining, just like the rest of them, we're no witness to the power of grace. That leads to this, how this is obtained. Hopefully you're wondering, how can I get more of this? I like what is said and so on, but it seems so theoretical. And I'm young and I haven't really learned these lessons and maybe it's for a future time. Beloved, there's no, in, in a sense, <clears throat> there's no such thing for us in regard to our response to the gospel as the future. Now is the day of salvation. Now is when obedience is required and exhorted upon us. So we're ready now to hear just how meekness is obtained and the cost. Well, the great cost, of course, is the death of Jesus on the cross. Jesus is the blesser of all of the Beatitudes that are spoken of in the Beatitudes of the Sermon on the Mount, in all of the Beatitudes of every single word of God, all of the blessings of them, Jesus is the author and the finisher. Because Jesus, you see, dies for blessing. He substitutes himself meekly in the form of a man, as a servant of Jehovah, who is the divine one, the Son of God, and he says, Though I am the Lord of glory, I condescend to come to this earth and I die for blessings and I die that my people might be meek. There's something about this meekness that cannot be denied, my people. I'll die for that. I'll die for their faith. I'll die for their justification. I'll die for their forgiveness. I'll die for their sanctification and their glorification. And I'll die for all the particulars of the ornaments that I want to crown them with. And that means meekness. That means meekness. Jesus died for meekness. Why then are we so cocky or rebellious or prone to anger first thing? Why then are we always claiming our rights, standing our ground, refusing to let it go? Jesus died that we might be meek. Think of that. Then his spirit within is given to us exactly for this, working daily to convert us. We're anointed with the spirit. We heard that this morning. To put off the old man, that's the proud man. And to put on the new man, that's the meek man. You see then, what I'm saying here and what the Bible teaches here is that meekness comes at a cost. It's the cost of the blood of the Son of God. And it's the cost of your own rights. It's the cost of your own self-improvement or self-assertion, I should say which is, again, the antithesis of meekness. Are you willing to pay that cost? You can't, of course, pay the cost of the redemption that Jesus purchased. But Christianity comes at a cost. And Jesus says, count the cost. Take up your cross and follow me. Don't just follow me without a cross. You can't do it. The cost of our rights, the cost of our lives. You see, this isn't a natural thing, is it? Some have said that meekness, well, that's a gentleman's virtue. In fact, the, the word can be prous and some of the other words that describe kindness and so on can be interpreted to mean gentlemen. And so you get a gentleman. He's, he's a man of manners, and he's a man who's, who's not going to transgress the civilities of society. And, and when he eats, he's not going to be a pig. And when he does this, he's going to be kind, and he's going to get out of the way of people and not offend them unnecessarily. This is not at all a gentleman's virtue, I say. It's a sinner's virtue. It's a saint's virtue. It's a redeemed person's virtue. Comes not from you and not from your civility and not from taking courses in etiquette and so on. It comes from heaven. 
through the cross, in your soul, by the working of the Spirit in grace. How we lack this, don't we? Oh, this is very humiliating to preach this. We're so easily provoked, aren't we? So easily do the strifes come. And right in our homes, and right with maybe past enemies, I find myself shouting at them in the car, driving down the road. Nobody will see how pathetic is my hanging on to this thing and that thing. Our ego's so great. Dies hard, doesn't it? Dies hard. We resent, will not submit to God. We don't receive well the reproach of men. Grace is necessary. Grace. And grace to give us to do some things about it. We can. By the grace of God, we can hear the word of God as he instructs us in the way we should go, in the way of attaining more meekness. So here's the first way. I have five, or two or three or four. Hear the preaching of the word. Now, how is that related to meekness? Well, we read in the Bible, faith comes by preaching. And we can conclude from the Bible that the virtue of meekness and all of the virtues that Jesus lists here, the poverty of spirit and so on, they are cultivated as we cultivate faith. That links us to the psalm that Jesus quotes here and the psalm that we read, Psalm 37. Psalm 37 that is quoted with regard to the inheritance blessing is also a psalm that reminds us that meekness is in the way of trusting in the Lord in your trials. When you receive something, if you would be meek and with regard to this and not show yourself, your fist, and your own natural courage or disgust, then you must believe and trust in the Lord, Psalm 37, verse 3, Trust in the Lord and do good. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him. He shall bring it to pass. This is words for life on the ground, folks. Words for life in this age, in this 21st century. I don't care what generation you are. If you are a generation of the sons of God, this is for you. Believe this word. Trust in the Lord. As the psalm begins and the psalm ends. The, the humility of a child of God is born of faith waiting on the Lord, trusting in him in hardships and in him to make the way clear in those hardships and even with hard people who are not maybe even anything but a son of a gun. But there's someone in your path you're to be meek toward. So hear the word of God. You hearing this word? Preach the word so that sinners are put in their place and Jesus is front and center, the place of the preaching. He's everything. He's everything. Second, follow the examples of meek men. In the Bible, Abraham, the father of the faithful, Meek in this in so many ways, but one is in when he deferred to Lot. Remember that? Lot, you can have the land. Just take the best of the land, whatever you want. And Lot chose, of course, the best of the land and pitched his tent towards Sodom. And you know the rest of the story. Moses, the meekest man on the earth, learned from him, but learned that he had to learn. Remember that? Remember, children, Moses was appointed by God to be the Savior and... and uh, he uh, is a special child, and he's hid, and he's raised in Pharaoh's house, and he's 40 years old, and he comes, and he sees the Egyptians manhandling an Israelite, and he slays the Egyptian. He thought that now would be the time when he would lead the people of God out. Well, not so. Moses had to flee. The people of God weren't ready, and Moses wasn't ready. And so for 40 more years... On the backside of a desert, taking care of sheep, meek sheep. 
Moses had to learn meekness, and so at 80 years old, he finally gets his charge. And then he goes, and he finds God at the burning bush, and he's shivering in his boots, and he hardly knows what to do. He's ready now. He's ready now. And I say some, to some people, and I t myself take confidence in this, because I went into the ministry a little later than some. I say to them who may be a little older, uh, you're not 80 yet. And it could be that you have one sermon to give. And so go through the seminary if need be and, and do all of the stuff in the Latin and the Greek if need be and learn from life and then you step on the pulpit and you're old and you're saying, what is this? It's not much of a career. You preach one sermon and you die. Well, so what? You preach. That's all that matters. We tend to gauge our success by length of time and numbers of converts. And God says, be meek and do my will, and I'll lead you, and I'll get the glory. Moses had to learn. David humbled himself before God, and oh, he had to humble himself before that creep, didn't he? Shimei was cursing David throwing stones at David and David's not meek bodyguards told David, let's just take this guy's head off. And David said, no, it's from the Lord. Now that's a meek man, a meek man. Jesus himself, of course, the lamb before the butchers, set forth for us as the Savior for our meekness, but then as the example of the meekest one in all of the world who went to the death of the cross, why? Because God said so. God said so. And I'm going to go there. So, hear the preaching of the word that faith may be built up. Follow the examples of meek men. Matthew Henry gives us this other tidbit of advice. Be loose from the things of the world. That's how you're meek when you lose the things of the world. Being loose from the things of the world so that you're calm when the ting things are taken away. That's how you're meek in this world. Fourthly, avoid the company of brawlers and bitter people. Delight in the company of the meek. And finally, but also firstly, study the cross. Delight in Jesus and life in him. So those are some practical things. They're ordinary things for all the virtues, aren't they? But they apply also to the gaining and advancement of meekness. And let us not forget that. With regard to all of these virtues that are, Jesus says, that are givens in the kingdom of heaven and that all of God's people have in principle, there, there is and there can be progress. You might say, well, no, 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 no. I'm too angry for that. I have too pa much of a past for that. I, I'm just too full of lust and all of these things and I just don't know how to do it and I've had such a bad go of it and don't you know, Domini, don't you know, Pastor, that my lot is so bad that it cannot possibly be the lot in the future of a meek one. Just let me go to bed and die. No. Are you alive now? Then the word of God is living and sharper than any two-edged sword to stab away from you the unmeekness, the unconverted parts to work in you powerfully to be the meek man you ought to be. For another worldly blessing of the world. That's my final point. The meek shall inherit the earth, as I said in, before in Psalm 37, which Jesus is quoting here. Five times there's a reference to this. Five times as a re reference to the righteous inheriting the land, those blessed by him shall inherit the earth, and on and on and on. What is this? Three things. First, I believe, because it's in the Old Testament here in Psalm 37, and among the people of God this psalm is to be sung, there's a promise here, a reference in the land that we shall inherit to the land of Canaan. The land in the Old Testament is invariably this land of Canaan. That's the center of the world. A little itty bit of, 
of uh, terra firma on the east side of the Mediterranean, the land of Canaan, the land of Palestine, the land of milk and honey, the land of Eden, as it's said in the Bible some way, is paradise, is the land that is the land of the people of God with God. There would be understood the fellowship of God. There were the ordinances of God. There was the temple, the tabernacle, later the temple of God. There would be this, this symbol, therefore, in the land and your place in it of your life with God. And, and so this applies to us. Jesus in the New Testament is speaking more broadly here of the land, namely that place you have in the arms of God. That place you have in the fellowship of God, in the kingdom of God, that's extending now beyond Canaan in the New Testament to all the world. So that, first of all, it's a reference simply, well, like unto the kingdom of heaven, of which Jesus has spoken in the first beatitude, and of which he shall speak in the last. But it's said here that we inherit the land. And I believe that there's more than a reference simply to our place in the kingdom and that we are kingdom people, that we have fellowship with God. I really believe that God is giving us this whole world. And as we are meek, we appropriate it. It is, it is given to us. I'm referring here to the astounding claim that Paul makes in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse um, <clears throat> 21, 22, and 23 of this. 1 Corinthians 1, 21, 22, and 23. Oh, it must be 2 Corinthians 1. 2 Corinthians 1. No, can't be it either. Anyway, it is a reference in Corinthians somewhere to the fact that we possess the world, all things. That's an amazing claim that the apostle makes there somewhere, believe me. The apostle says that all things are yours. And he goes on to say the past is yours, the present is yours, the future is yours, this, this world is yours, this whole thing is yours. And you are Christ, that's why it's yours. Because Christ has bought this for you. And Christ is God's. And therefore, this whole thing is legitimate. Now, you don't own my house, and I don't own your house. And you don't own people, and I don't own people. But the idea is simply this. You are given to enjoy life with God wherever you go in this world. It's similar to what Paul says of the blessing of God's providence. All things work together for good to those who love God, who are the called according to his purpose. And that, I know, is Romans 8.28. And I know this as well. Romans 8.32 speaks of the fact that Jesus is given and of the fact that since he's given, shall he not also freely with him give us all things? All things are yours, beloved. The world is yours. Go and claim it for Jesus. Go and be a Christian where it's not impossible to be a Christian. Where is it not impossible to be a Christian? Everywhere. As you go and are following the Lord, that is. You're following God and God is leading you and you can be a Christian wherever God leads you. All things are yours and you can enjoy this world and even the small portion you may have. And so that's why Psalm 37, which speaks of inheriting the land, even goes on to seek, speak of this in this wonderful foretaste of the spiritualness of the blessing. Verse 16, a little that a righteous man has is better than the riches of many wicked. A little that a righteous man has is, many, is better than the riches of many wicked. And he's speaking now of the blessing of being a Christian even though you're as poor as a church mouse. Now, of course, Jesus is speaking in the future. He's speaking of a future blessing. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. But I believe there's something present also about the blessing of the earth being ours. This earth is sanctified for our use, for our reception, and for our walking in. Now, of course, there's places that are illegitimate to us, as God tells us in one way or another, don't go there. You can't just say, well, this bar is mine. 
And here I go, drinking one after the other with my buddies, even though it may be at liberty for some to enter. For you, with your motivation and your problem with drinking, you cannot be a child of God and be thinking that you're going to inherit the land when all you're interested in is beer in the land. Let's be real. God is so wonderful to give us a place in the kingdom, in this world. We don't just wait for these things. They're ours now. This whole place is ours now. That's why Paul could say in Romans as well, that we're more than conquerors through him that loved us, and so that all things that are against us can't be against us. They can't effectually divide us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. They can't take away our enjoyment of God in this world, in this nastiness. They can't take away from my peace with God, even though they seek to ruffle my feathers. And that wicked man who comes again and again, and he knows my weakness, and he knew that I'd respond in anger and in, in terrible anger and bitterness before, he can't understand me now, whom like a who, 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 like a wall to this guy because of the meekness that God has given to me. That's the idea of inheriting the land. And I believe there's a, a present remarkable aspect of that blessing for us right now. And the fact is that as God's people are converted and the knowledge of God covers the face of the earth, this whole world soon becomes God's, the, that which belongs to the people of God, literally. As God's people are saved from the nations, and they're the ones whom God is calling from the nations, well, the whole world now is filled with those people of God. It belongs to the people of God, and, and all of the culture is turned for the good of the people of God and the gathering of the church and even the enemies and the wars and the rumors of wars serve the signs of the kingdom of heaven. But finally, this, this. We shall inherit the earth. That's a reference, no doubt, to the land of the new heaven and the new earth. Second Peter 3, we shall inherit a new heaven and a new earth. That's glory. That's paradise. And that is obtained the same way the blessing of meekness itself is attained. Through Christ, of course. That's attained by grace the same way the meekness virtue is attained. The land is attained. And notice Jesus stresses this. We inherit the land. And inheritance is a gift. And by grace we share, therefore, in this life with God now, and then in the future, as Jesus himself is our life. Is he your life? Is he your meek Savior, who is the meek Lamb of God and the roaring Lion of the tribe of Judah, powerful to save and to incorporate you into his body and to give you to be meek? Is he our Savior? I mean on the ground, that he might be in heaven our Savior forever. Praise God for him. And go away, people of God, go away into this world, meek and meeker and meeker as you see the day approaching. Amen. We thank you, Father, for the word of God. We pray may it be powerful to save us, to turn us to you, to teach us the way of meekness and of sanctification. We thank you for Jesus, our Savior who is our life, who is our example of meekness. And we pray as him to be servants of you, O Lord, and those who relish the possibilities in this life of showing that we are yours, your meek lambs, your meek sheep, following the path of our shepherd all the way home. Amen.